Hello everyone and welcome to the business. I'm your host Nizar Ashraf and today I've got a very special guest with me. Some of you may know her from season two of the Rap Game UK and I'm really excited to just get into a conversation about her progression and her journey since then. It's Alicia, aka Swagger Alicia. Let's get into it. What are you said? Hello, how <laughs> hey. are you? Um, if you can just briefly introduce yourself to, yeah, the people at home watching. Yep. So my name is Leisha, as you said, aka Swagger Leisha. I'm a singer, rapper, producer from East London, best known for my time on the Rap Game UK. So yeah, I've just still been doing music since then. Okay, sick. So before we even just get into the Rap Game, I want to just speak about, you know, your upbringing before the Rap Game and everything. Um, so you come from East London. Mm -hmm. Born and bred. Born and bred. And when did you start to feel that passion for music? So my passion for music actually started very young. So from primary school, I was in the school choir. I was rapping, I was singing. My mum listened to a lot of soul music and my dad listened to a lot of hip hop. So I think that is what influenced my sound. Every time I came home from school, there was always music playing whilst the cooking was going on. So it was just, I was always around music. Um, and I just loved it. And then as I got to secondary school, my dad bought me a piano. Mm. And that's when I really started like honing in my skills and talents. I just sitting down after school, playing the piano, writing tunes. So literally from primary mm. school, I've known that music is what I wanted to do full time. Okay. Sounds like your house is good vibes, man. Yeah, it was yeah. a real good vibe. Yeah, <laughs> music always playing. And it was different different vibes as well because mm. my parents love to listen to a wide variety of music. Like, my mum really loves Maroon 5 as well. Like mm. So there was just all sorts going on in terms of the music in the household. Okay, lit. So let's speak about your dad. Um, you said that your dad bought you a piano um, when you were younger. So, mm -hmm. And as we have seen from the show, your dad's been kind of your backbone, your support system, your manager. Yeah. So what is your relationship like with your dad? My relationship with my dad is amazing. Like he's always supported what I've been doing. Like if I want to do something, he kind of goes above and beyond to make sure that I do it to the best of my ability. So even like when I was younger in school, I did feel like he was being hard on me in terms of my performances, because I used to be very shy. Mm -hmm. I used to get up on the stage and kind of just stand there, sing the song. And I'll come on and off and he'll be like, you know, you sang the song well, but do you not want to bust a little move? Do you not want to move a little <laughs> yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, back then I used to be like, oh, just say you like it. But now I understand why he was so hard on me, because I think he could see like the potential mm. um and it's helped me all, all of those talks that we had back then has helped me get to where i am now i'd say so yeah i've always i always appreciate him because mm. he's just always gone above and beyond mm. for me yeah no that's a real it's a real blessing to have a parent that really sees beyond what you can see for yourself exactly. mm -hmm. and sees your potential and tells you like this is like you have potential to do this um okay lit so with your mum as well um you know we saw from the show that your relationship was a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, since the show, have things changed and improved, would you say? Um, I'll definitely say they have improved a lot more. Like, I think now my mum sees that I'm really trying to do this music thing and this music thing is for real. I think the most of the reasons why before she was a little bit stressed is because she was in the music industry herself mm -hmm. and she kind of understood um, how complex it can be. And I think she was more worried that I wouldn't be able to handle it. Yeah. But I think from watching the show, she was able to see that I can really handle the trials and tribulations that do come with being in the industry. Okay. So yeah, it has helped us move on from that. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the moments that I really liked seeing was when, I think you were kind of expressing that, you know, your mum wasn't really involved as we kind of just spoke in here. But there was a moment where I think you were on FaceTime and your mum and dad were together and she was like, I'm proud of you, shine like a diamond. <laughs> that was a really nice moment, man, because when a parent says it, it's really heartfelt, especially when you've been kind of wanting and waiting to hear it. Yeah, I really felt that. And then I think in the next episode, she actually we actually had a talk and she gave me this great advice. Is it? And I was like, well, we've really broken down that barrier and it was a really, really nice moment. Like I felt like I can really like flourish to my full potential because I've literally got both my parents back in me like full wholeheartedly. Mm. So yeah. Nah, that is that is great. And aside from that, now you were a performing arts student, right? Correct. So you yeah. went to the Royal School of Speech and Drama. Mm -hmm. Now let's just get into a conversation about representation and how it felt like being a, a young black female in a drama school as such. 
Okay, so there wasn't many of us, first mm. of all. Um, so that was interesting to navigate in terms of like finding my tribe, like finding my crew. Yeah. So I was kind of, for the first year, just kind of doing my own thing, float, floating in a way. Um, but I did manage to make connections, like long life connections. There were people that were like batting hard for, you know, um, the BAME to just mm. like come together and do stuff together. So in a way we did kind of click up <laughs> which was cool mm. but yeah there wasn't many of us in the drama school so it was a very big thing for me to actually get into central because there was literally five um black students even the process to get into a school like that is so when you go back to your family and, and tell them you got in it's like this crazy thing because you're like wow like one or five black students that mm. make it so that was crazy yeah that's mad and so even just being in an institution like that, and you know, you touched on not really feeling like you found your tribe. Was there a sense of feeling like, oh, I can't even bring my world into this place? Um, yeah, sometimes it did feel like you have to have a bit of a game face because you don't want to come across as, you know, too leery, the mm. one that's not going to get the work done because people do have that kind of perception. And where I grew up in Chinkford, um, and I went to a school that was predominantly white, I had mm. already dealt with that and saw how that made me feel um but at the same time you know i didn't dim my light or anything but it was just like when you go in just like straight focus i felt like i had to work a lot harder than maybe the other students had to to get to the end and do well but you know i left i did well and i was happy with my yeah. experience there so yeah. no that's good and just what you said about working a lot harder you know we know how it is do you know yeah, what i'm saying our parents tell us from young like from young, man, <laughs> you're from gonna young. have to it's work unfortunate harder. but that's that's life mm -hmm. for us um all right cool so before you were on the rap game by day you were a property inventory, inventory clerk. clerk yeah talk to us about that so um that job is literally you go to the property i got to see some really nice ones and i have to describe it from top to bottom so my dad actually is like a property manager, property developer. So I almost fell into like that because I grew up also hanging around him doing that. Mm. Like I used to kind of follow him around whilst he used to do that. So property is like one of my second loves, like after arts. Did you watch a show on Netflix called, um, I think it's called Selling Sunset? Yes, I love that show. Because it's all about property. <laughs> Even though there's mix up and pass art, there's like the properties that there. So is that kind of like... Yeah, like um, maybe not as, you know, suave and selling yeah, yeah. sunsets because there are some nice some properties nice on there. Still. But, you know, like there were some good properties. Um, some days, I guess the biggest properties are the hardest days because you might have like a five bedroom mm. property and, you know, you've got to go through it. But, but by the time I'd been doing it for about three years, I could literally bang that out in an okay. hour. Whereas when I first started, it would take me like three. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so now you're not, are you still doing property inventory clerk or you've, Come away from it so i've moved away from that so i'm now working um i'm about to start working for a company called abundant life so okay. they are a record label yeah and i'm just going to be run like helping with the general day to day so after rap game i wanted to just kind of do music full time full time and make sure everything i'm doing is about the arts mm. and with this role now i'll be able to kind of learn the marketing the ins and outs so that i can take that information and kind of use it for what exactly. i'm trying to do exactly because it's good to be informed even though you're you know the entertainment exactly okay so with the property stuff is it something that you're still interested in you're still passionate about yeah it's definitely something i'm still passionate about i think what i'm trying to do is really focus on the music get to where i'm going with the music and then use that music money once it comes through properly to kind of invest maybe start up my own inventory company because it's okay. like a low startup but you know you could build it up quite well yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. my plan for like the next couple of years okay cool Okay, so now I think it's fitting for us to speak about the rap game. How did this come about for you? How did you even find out an audition? What so, was the process? So um, actually, it's, you know, like people you know. So long story short, um, for my 18th birthday, I had like a live lounge night. I invited all my family down and my pianist cancelled on me last minute. So I had to call my studio and just say, look, bro, do you know anybody that can come and play piano for me? So he gave me a guy, he came down, played for me, and he um, was working at Ronnie Scott's at the time. I don't know if you know the jazz bar in Soho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he invited me down to perform with him on that night. 
when I performed the next day with him, there was a scout there that was scout scouting nice. for The Voice. Okay. So I then auditioned for The Voice that same week. But when I auditioned, they told me that I was a better rapper than I was a singer because right. I sang Mahalia Sober, but added my own rap verse to it. Okay. So they were like, yeah, your bars are sick, but we're not too sure about the vocals for The Voice because you know for The Voice you need like yeah. that strong, yeah. powerful voice. Um, so yeah, a couple months had gone by and then I got a call from the same lady who said she was now working on the production for a rap show. She didn't say it was rap game. She just said, I think this show would be perfect for you if you'd like to come and audition. So I was actually one of the first people to audition for Try rap down. game. So I had to wait like months on months on months on months to actually get an answer. Um, so yeah, I had my first audition. That went well. Then a couple months later, they called me back. I had to come back in and do like a face-to-face -face interview mm. where they literally ask you about your whole life. And was that camera. with the mentors on the show? It wasn't with the mentors, okay. no. So this is the production team. Yeah. And then, so I didn't actually meet Crept Conan and Target until that right. first day that you see them in, in the audition on the okay. panel. Um, and then, yeah, I found out that I'd got it. So she was working on The Voice, but moved over to Rap Game and just thought that the show would be perfect for me. I think she was right. <laughs> okay, sick. All right, so... When you were first on the show, I think as your journey progressed, we just saw changes. But from the initial kind of point of the show, there were kind of slip ups in your performances. Mm -hmm. We just touch on this and speak about, you know, those times where you were, you felt under pressure and you couldn't deliver and perform to mm -hmm. the best of your potential, as we have seen. I think with my initial audition, I didn't factor in um, how maybe one starstruck I was going to be because I've been a big fan of Crapton Conan for yeah. a long time. So it was only when I actually stepped forward, like it was like a shaky, a shaky moment. Um, as well as that, I decided to stay up all night and drill my bars and I didn't get any sleep. I had a coffee. Oh, <laughs> so I was just very jittery that day. Yeah. I was very nervous. Um, and I knew the bars. It was almost like every time the camera came off me, I like went to the side and I'm like, Leisha, you know these bars, like what's going on? So it was a mixture of all of that. Mm. Um, and as the competition went on, I realised that I needed to change my technique. So what I would do is write bars, take an, like two hours, just go through them, go through them, look away, and then maybe just have a little bit of a rest, take a yeah. nap so the bars can just like really soak in exactly. and then come back to it and I would know the bars. Yeah. So I was good up until the clash, obviously. I, I think again, Graft came in, the whole crowd was like going <laughs> ham, chanting his bars. You know, he brought up some like sour topics. Like, yeah. so again, I kind of forgot myself again and went back into that shell, that, that shell. zone where I, couldn't get my bars out because I was going through like a lot of anxiety in that moment mm. and then obviously the lockdown happened and I was able to have a pep talk with myself and say Leash this is BBC this is a big opportunity mm. come correct mm. <laughs> okay just on what you touched on yeah I can't do this interview without just touching on it but the Paul Pogba thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know when you wore the t-shirt I was like Good move, because you owned it yeah. and you made something out of it. But my gosh. I just wasn't expecting was the props. Like, there was so much It was Droid on. holding the bag. No, it was Droid holding the bag for me. Like, literally, because me and Droid are so cool. So I was like, Droid, <laughs> what's going on here? But, um, you know, I completely understand. Like, we were in a competition. Mm. I think Graft had, like, messed up. Because we had a uh, conversation afterwards. He said, look, he'd messed up. And he had a point to prove um, in terms of, like, Crepton Conan. Yeah. He's a footballer. So when Conan told him that he wasn't on the pitch, it, yeah. he got very offended by that. Which is why he was like, you know, we've got to go above and beyond. And I actually got very offended by it at the time. But then I realised, I think, a little bit later that it was kind of just a football reference he was saying that you know he wasn't really coming for black woman's hair because i know a lot of like the mm. black community did come for him on twitter after oh. that because they were like you can't come for a black woman's hair like okay. that okay yes yeah, so. yeah okay mad all right cool so there was a break in production mm -hmm. due to the due to the pandemic um covid and everything was that like a five month pause yeah okay was. and so as dj target said it Alicia is a lockdown glow up queen. <laughs> you went away in those five months and you came back like a different person. Like, it was like, who's this girl on our screens now? Because what I think all the viewers could see at home was this transition. 
And it wasn't like, do you know what? In the beginning, I was like, yeah, Alicia's calm. Like, she's cool. She's very humble, easygoing. And I think you're still that way. But when you came back, it's like, no, she's about her game. Like, you're on your job and you delivered and you continue to deliver. And I think from that point, it was when you came first in the orchestra challenge. I think yeah. it was the orchestra. Um, the it, town hall. It, the, it was the um, social issues challenge. The social issue, yeah. issues challenge. Um, I think that was a very iconic moment for the show. And I think just the way you came and delivered and your bars, like your bars were hard. Thank you. But I think for me, it was as a viewer seeing that, you know, the other contestants weren't happy at all. Yeah, and that what was did that feel like? Because it was your first win, like literally, and people around you weren't supportive. I think it, it was quite a hard moment for me, especially because um, when I hadn't been in those top spots, I'd been very supportive with, of everybody else. Yeah. And I kind of just held my position, but just thought about what I could do to work harder to get to that top spot. Um, so it was quite disheartening for me when I got to the top spot and you know, there was like all these comments and I could feel the energy from downstairs. Actually, like when I did get the top spot, I didn't actually feel happy because I mm. knew what I was going to have to deal with when I got back. Um, but as well, I think that's a learning curve for me as well, that I can't really take on other people's emotions. You so that's it. one thing I learned on yeah. the rap game, 100%. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just not dimming my light because I think in in the first half, there was that moment of me dimming my light to make people feel better and, you know, just keeping it humble, humble. But there's only so much humbleness you can bring to a I'm competition, you, do you know what I mean? I'm telling you, because I think for me as a viewer, like, I was just like, because at home I was just like, I wish Leisha was the type of person right now that would be vocal because I think when one of the other boys said, oh no, you were first for me, I was thinking, blood, yeah. what? I, my dad actually did pull me up on that. Like He's like, you need to speak up for yourself a lot more because I'm not a confrontational person at all. Yeah. But I know how this industry can be cutthroat and sometimes you do need exactly. to I have that moment to speak up. Exactly, I think this is just a glimpse of it. Up. Yeah, 100%. That was mad. Yeah, that was mad. I'm the kind of person to just be like, okay, you said that, that's how you feel. Yeah. But I don't need it to like affect my emotions yeah. in a way. But sometimes I think things do need to be spoken on and people do need to know that like you can't really do that or move like that. Yeah. So on the show, I think, as you said, you know, speaking up for yourself, all these different things that you weren't kind of doing, but you kind of progressively started to learn how you can kind of be that person for yourself mm -hmm. because unfortunately you're in a kind of environment where you're going to need to be that person for yourself. What we have seen is I think a remarkable journey of you growing in confidence even up to this day. Yeah. Let's speak about how you've been able to just I guess like transition into this person now that is very comfortable doing what they are doing and just living the life. Mm -hmm. So I think on Rap Game, you know, I had that gentle progression, like even down to my final freestyle. I think that was the moment where, you know, I wore the shirt. I, I said what I needed to say in my bars. Like I didn't necessarily say it to people, but I said it in my bars and people heard what I had to say. And then, you know, when you have people like Wretch, Miss Banks, Jay and mm. me telling you, keep going, you're sick, you're, you're going to make it. It just helps with your confidence quite a lot. So after leaving the show, there's some opportunities that have come about and I've just been ready to take them because my confidence level is just growing and growing. And the more I'm putting out music, people are feeling it. Yeah. So it's just like every day I'm just trying to level up even more. So that's my goal, just to keep, keep going, keep levelling up. Okay. And obviously, like right now today, we're living in age of social media mm -hmm. and as you said you know when the show was released there were people talking on twitter and so there was a point in the series where i think you were having a conversation with zones about social stereotypes and the effects of social media and what what i kind of have seen is um the whole narrative of ladies in the industry having to sexualize themselves mm -hmm. in order to sell and we all know that sex sells. Um, but what I'm kind of coming to basis is with, even recently I saw an interview with Ivorian Doll. Mm -hmm. and she was saying she basically has just given into that image to succeed. And she said, you know, it's not me, but it's selling. That's basically what she was saying. And I know you mentioned that you're trying to find that middle ground to really find a balance. Personally for you, how are you doing with the whole kind of, you know, those kind of, I guess, I don't know if it's microaggressions, but 
like needing to kind of sexualize yourself in order to sell and do well? Um, so for me, I've not really found it as a need, but as I said on the show, like I do enjoy being sexy. I do enjoy doing that, but like, it's not something I feel like I have to do to make my music sell. Yeah. Um, so I've not come across that moment yet where I feel like, you know, I have to, I'm just exploring my art as I want to putting out what it is that I want to put out and just seeing how people receive it. And I'm just going to keep going until like I find that hit. So basically I'm just doing me wholeheartedly at the moment yeah okay that's lit okay and you know with the show you came you came in the top three at the end i did and i can't lie i was like that's right because (laughs) no like i think just with seeing just the progression of everyone individually i think you you went through the most character development on the show just in terms of coming out of your shell being confident even that thing at the end with Kenny also, I was like, raw, Alicia's coming aggressive <laughs> with the bars. Like, and I think it was so unexpected. Like, even when Crypto Kona were like, raw, I was like, yeah, it was so unexpected. But you really, you really like renewed people's minds mm-hmm. of what you can do. Definitely. And I think there was a point where someone, there was a point where one of the guys said, oh no, Alicia's probably fifth. And you came first. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Watching it back was because I didn't hear all of that because mm. I wasn't in the room. So I, I only felt the energy and what I heard at the time. And obviously the energy in the house was just terrible. Like, <laughs> it was crazy. It? But um, watching it back was, I think, even harder for me because it was like there was so much even going on in the in the back. And people that I thought wouldn't have been involved in all okay. of that were involved in all of that. Yeah. So, yeah, the TV world was, was a bit wild, actually. <laughs> so when you watched it back, did you feel like you were reliving those moments? Yeah, like some moments were definitely hard to watch back. Like the clash was, it was bittersweet. Like it's, it's hard to watch. Like it's like, ooh. But then at the same time, it's like, um, it was a moment for me at the same time. Like a lot of people reached out to me and said, you know, they loved the way that I just handled that, stood mm. my ground, didn't get angry. Like even Crepton Conan said, like, if this was a normal clash, like people would probably be fighting. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I think people just, the hard times in the competition for me, helped build my character and helped show people like who I am as a person Mm. so yeah okay right so moving on from the rap game now since then you've been able to put out music Mm -hmm. you've been doing music videos any I can see so that's one of your singles that you've released Mm -hmm. and there's a music video to it Mm -hmm. now the concepts the writing process how was that so um, I actually wrote any I can see a year ago today, funnily okay. enough. So <laughs> literally in the pandemic, I think, you know, I went to a party and I had like a really good time and I kind of just um, enhanced the feelings that I felt on that day and wrote this banging tune. It was really random. Um, I literally it came from the heart. I just wrote it mm. and I sang it to one of my friends, Katora, and she was like, Leash, you need to put this, you need to put this out because it was kind of one of my throwaway songs. And yeah, I dropped it and people were just really feeling it. People were saying that it's a timeless tune. But I guess because it really did come from my heart, that's why people can feel that. And so, all right, so now you're fully fledged out from the Rap Game UK. Your career has kicked off Mm -hmm. and, you know, your audience is growing and everything. What can we expect from you? What is coming up? What, yeah, what's going on, Leisha? So we've got Freak for a Lifetime music video coming out soon. You're going to see me busting a move. So I'm oh. literally learning the choreography at I'll the swear. moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm bringing a new element to this music video. Um, also some more TV stuff coming from me as well. And yeah, more music. I'm dropping a new song called Baseline Love in Baseline the next Love. month or so. So that's going to have like a commercial but Afrobeat feel. Okay. So I'm tapping into like my Nigerian roots with okay. that one. you're Nigerian? I'm half Nigerian, yeah. My mum is Jamaican. Okay. Yeah, so I've got a little bit of a mix. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Um, And I think what I wanted to ask you is, you know, have you grown thicker skin? (laughs) (laughs) 100%. Like, even over, like, uh, since leaving Rap Game, I've had many talks with myself just to be like, okay, I can't let certain things that go on dishearten me. I can't, I just have to keep going. You know, you have a lot of outside noise and you have to just tune it out, literally. Mm. So I'd say the process of being on Rap Game and the process of being a musician after coming off TV has definitely helped me grow thicker skin. 
And what advice would you give for anyone that goes into a similar process like you, such as the rap, the rap game? I would say you have to go in with full confidence in yourself. Like, if you don't believe in yourself, it's going to be hard for you to really, like, push through. So, yeah, just have full confidence and just keep going. Tune out the outside noise. And if you do feel like there's any unjust things going on, speak up about mm. it. Speak on it. Good advice. Good advice. And... For everyone who's watching, mm -hmm. where, they, where can they find you? Where can they find out more about your music? Mm -hmm. So on every social media platform, Twitter, Instagram, I'm Leisha Land. So that's L-E-S-I-A-L-A-N-D underscore. New music coming soon. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. This has been The Business with your boy, Nizar Ashraf. And I've had a lovely conversation with Leisha, aka Swagger Leisha. Um, and yeah, over and out.